all over the world, California is known for these giant trees. There's, there's two giant trees in California, the redwood and the sequoia. And the redwood tree is used for timber, making, it doesn't rot, so it's used for timber. So we cut them all. We started in the, when we found gold in California in the pioneer days, and we started cutting them then, right up till now. And we literally cut 95% of these great trees with this fervor of cutting that never relaxed to think about, wait, what if we cut them all? Mike Fay, my colleague who walked across Congo that I've photographed for two years, he decided that he would walk the length of the redwood forest to describe to the world what the condition of it was, scientific condition. So I was brought in to, to document that big compass that I just laid out for you. And I had to start it with the idea of, well, we got to celebrate one of these great trees. And that was, that's the genesis of it. And it took, it's a two-year project that I spent a year living in California for. These trees you can't see. When you stand on the ground in front of them, you just see the, a little bit of the bottom. So I knew that I had that, just that task of the star photo. I had to make a photo that led and drew everyone in. And then I wanted to celebrate the two sides of the story. I wanted to show you the people that were so wonderful that lived there, and then the people that cut the trees. They were also wonderful that were just trying to do a job. Had to find a tree. I had to get permission from the parks to do all this rope work. I had to get the scientists to agree to help me because they, they've, there's been a reaction to naming the trees, telling people where they are. So there's a lot of secrecy involved. And I, I actually knew the tree that I want to photograph and it was the tree that you see 20 meters behind me. So, but that's the first tree that the scientist, Steve Sillett, said, oh, if you're thinking about that one, you can't, we're not going to climb it. It's retired. Because they had studied it for 20 years. It's, it's the most complex tree known on Earth. And for all of these, the people out there that love them and study them, this is their favorite tree because it's so majestic in its shape. And it's not the tallest, it's not the biggest, it's the second largest tree. But it just has character. And it, uh, it's, the name implies in Tolkien's world, the mother of the universe. And you actually feel something, when you touch it, you feel, wow, there's something here. It's been around for 1,500 years. I have to give homage to a man named Jim Balog who did this first. And he did a five-year project about trees. And of course the redwoods are the tallest, so they were important to him. I come along when we have a, a file, a cameras that will do just about anything you can dream of. I couldn't have made my picture five years ago. Couldn't even have considered it 10 years ago. But my rope guy, the guy in the red coat said, why don't you use the, t the dolly that we use in filmmaking? I've never crossed filmmaking techniques. And he said, we, we have to do things with precision because the camera has to move smoothly. So why don't you try our dolly? And that was our big breakthrough. And I used a software from the UK that uh, one of our colleagues at Canon had told me about a man named Breeze, who does software for film industry and stuff. And that let us control three Canon cameras. They all had, uh, they were DS cameras with 35 1.4s. I had to have super precise focus. I had no idea how precise you could focus with the um, little screen, the live view. So we did the blow up thing, we got it just perfectly focused and our rope doesn't move very much so now we've, we've got that covered. So I'm able to confidently shoot at 2.8 rather than 5.6 or f8. The other thing is I'm how much brighter is it at the top of this tree at the bottom? I'm shooting 200 ISO up there and 1600 down here and constantly and I've got control of three cameras we've got a cable running from these ropes and platforms down to my computer and I was literally shifting the exposures in all three cameras because one of them might see a lot more sky we didn't do auto because you just you had to have a, a, a more regulated flow so I could marry the pairings as I was going down So. 
you know, we would be able to accomplish this in about an hour, each drop. That meant our photograph covered an hour of the earth. That way I had a possibility of it having character of light and, and being a, somewhat of a moment. Okay, it's only an, it's an hour, it's not a millisecond, but it's not a day or... When James Balog would do this, it would take him six hours and there was then become no character of light. And if you see this photo, the tree's glowing. So we did it 19 days, every day for, and that's the only day in the 19 that the, the clouds came a certain way enough to, for the sun to shine through and make the tree glow. While this is happening, I have an assistant in another tree that's got a giant flashlight that's lighting the dark side of the tree to give form to that side. So we, I knew what the, what had to be done to make the tree have its shape. And that's also why there's the, the figures in the photograph. They're, they are people that love the tree and study it, but they're also there for scale. Because we, we wanted to give a sense of what a human looks like with this, a, a sense of awe. And so that, that bit of scale does that. 84 different images from three Mark II DS's uh, with 35 1.4s. So we're making panoramas, horizontal panoramas, that we're going to then stitch together. It was very important for us that when this was done that the scientist said, that's our tree. Because the other photos that have been done, he's like, no, she's too long, it's not accurate. The, how can she have two limbs like that? He, he would get very frustrated if the stitching wasn't as accurate as we could possibly make it. Of course, there's, there's flaws and that would be fun to look for, but it's as close to being an accurate rendition as possible. This was published in September of uh, 2009 as a cover story of National Geographic and we made a five page fold out. Well, of course, paper costs money and National Geographic has such a large circulation that each page costs a lot of money and we're all in a financial crisis. So I'm in the layout and we, we've got a four page fold out plan, which is already a, a lot of fold out. And we realized it didn't look, it didn't have power. And we said, we've got to add another page so it fills out. You get more width the more pages you go. And the art director says, well, okay, who has to lose their job for us to print this? And, and that was a really a, a, a gigantic realization at National Geographic. Not just about this tree, it's about what, why are we here? Are we here to, to make money? Are we here to support ourselves? Are we here to, to do this right? And the publisher said, we can't think like that. No matter how bad this gets, we can't think like that. Print it. And it's our most popular issue of the year. And it's, this picture is, they've offered it online for print sales just as a, a, an inexpensive way that people can get this photo. I spent three weeks trying to photograph this tree and I'm putting tripods on the tree that I'm in to try to go all the way to the top and see all of this tree. And what happened is the third session I realized I was trapped in the branches of my own tree and my, my project was dead. But what, what the tripoding bit did, it let us get into dusk and that's what I wanted the mystery of the forest is purple fog. This lady, when he got the job and took over the company, she sent him a small redwood tree and a jar and said, I want to talk to you. And they, it had been so con conflicting before. They were tear gassing and pepper spraying and it was a war. And so she made a gentle entree to this gentleman and they decided to meet. And he knew that I would care about this and she said, Nick, I'm going to meet some of the tree sitters. And we went out and this is a moment when she realizes he's because he's tied a piece of flagging on the tree that says do not cut so she knows now her tree is safe she can relax and so it's literally that moment i guess the point of this picture is that these are the people that helped me do this work and they're the scientists he's steve sill and there's a book called wild trees it's a bestseller about his life climbing these trees and that's his wife. But these, this is the core group that helped me. And then the big tree, the guy in the red shirt, he's the one that showed me how to climb trees again. But Cooley, this is 150 feet up the tree. That fire burned 600 years ago, and the tree's still fully alive. 
and bats and things live in that cave. He calls it a fire cave. I'm known in the world as a wildlife photographer, and Visa Port Limage is known as a social journalism festival. So why would I not be at the nature festival? Because I, I totally come from the storytelling background. My, my whole idea is that you use photography to affect change and to make people aware of things. So this is a place that I feel much kinship to. I've been coming since the early 90s when I had my first exhibit here. I, every time I would come into this chapel at Visa Port Limage, I would think, boy, I want to have an exhibit in there someday, and I want that wall. But I, you know, so when we, last year when I was here, I thought, that's where this tree belongs, inside a church. Because there's, for me, church is trees anyway. You know, I, that's my religion. So this, this is just a perfect setting for this photograph. And, and if you watch the people that come to see it, you'll see that they're, they're really getting it. It's framed perfectly by the building. It's just a, it's lit. When I do it outside, there's so much glare. There's a lot of problems with, with being able to exhibit it properly. If you show this, even that five page fold out, it's just too small. How are you gonna do it? So, so it's, it's not that size matters so much. It's just when, you, when you're trying to celebrate that and show it as what it is, this is the perfect place to do that. If you, if you do passionate work that you really care about, it's like if you build it, they will come. So what I'm trying to say is if you do the work, someone will buy it and you can survive. You'll figure that part out. So the part that would seem the hardest to me is not even an issue. It's bringing back to the concept of find something you really, really care about and just go crazy with it. Not moving around. Not, I mean, I just can't promote, be a proponent of being a generalist because it's, for me, it's all about passion. So that's what I've got to relay is, and, and you find happiness in that. If, you, if you're documenting something or illustrating it or glorifying it, 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 it makes you a part of that. And so, you know, I'm a part of Jane Goodall. I'm a part of Mike Fay. I'm a part of this tree. So I get a huge amount of kickback from the work. And so I, I would suggest that as a young photographer, finding your voice and in finding your voice, you're going to find something that you feel you've got to scream to the world about.